unregister and take states, saying that the, the migration was successful. So this means that if other objects still send messages to the old object, it will be transferred, <coughs> those messages will be redirected to the new object for one second or maximum 1,000 messages. And here is how I do the polyformis. Uh, what I'm doing here is just changing the player object from, for example, a player to a plant. This is my main loop for the object. I do some stuff here that we don't need to care about, about the tick. You can basically set a tick in an object, making it tick every two seconds or something like that. Uh, here we receive a message, and we basically call the handle message function on that message. And here you can see the interesting, in the handle message, I have a state here, and the type is highlighted in green. The type is basically player, or plant, or tree, or rock, or a module. Basically. Uh, you can do a lot of things when commands uh, and synchronous commands and events happen. You can see that I do call type, for example, that would be player, or it would be uh, plant or, or a tree or something like that, that handles this event. Uh, and I have something called down here, transform to new type, which basically means I just, uh, since Erlang doesn't support variables, you have to create a new state when you want to create a new variable. So this means that I take my old state, but I replace the type with this new type. So if I was a player, and I sent in transform to, to a plant, I will create a new state of it, which with the new type a plant, and I will start looping on that instead. So the next time I call this type will now be plant, and when stuff sends messages to me, I will call in uh, the, fu the functionality to the plant module instead. That was all about the server. Um, I still have seven slides to go, so we could either take a break or have some questions. Any questions? So you want to take a break or you want to go, go on with the client stuff? You can go on. You can go on with the client stuff. This is um, basically how the client is structured. It's a model view controller logic architecture. Uh, it's a mix between the common model view controller and another common three tire uh, theme, which basically means that you divide the presentation logic from the data logic or the data view. Uh, it's built on weak references, which means that the model and view and control and logic are not really are not really dependent upon each other. They can call each other in different ways, but they don't really in the code. They don't really have an independency on each other. Uh, first, like this, uh, the control the controller listens for network or keyboard or mouse input or joystick or any basically any kind of input. Uh, it creates events and sends those to the logic. The logic decides what to do. This will also result in um, the logic putting stuff into the model. And the view basically renders whatever is in the model. So this means that you can actually delete the view while running the game client, and the game would still be running, but you wouldn't see anything. So you could basically, for example, change from OpenGL to DirectX during runtime without having to restart anything. You 
used to be like that. It will be a window, the window will close up, and the new window will be up again, uh, and the game will just run as usual, but with a new uh, DirectX implementation. So what do I mean with weak references? How can classes we just don't really know about each other communicate in C++? To take a look at this, uh, you, you, you see that the, uh, we have a model listener class uh, which the view inherits. Uh, and the model view, uh, sorry, the model listener class is really an interface. An interface in C++ means that uh, when you inherit, when the view inherits model listener, it has to implement those three functions or else the code won't compile. So this means that when the model here calls the model listener it knows that these uh, uh, functions exist. So the view inherits from the model listener and then it calls into the model registering itself as a model listener. So the model actually gets uh, calls saying, oh, a model listener registered on me. So whenever something happens, for example, when an object is created, I go uh, through a list of my listeners and just call an object has been created in them. It doesn't really know that it is the view, it just sees it as a number of model listeners. So, uh, the benefit of that is if I need to change something in the view, the model doesn't really need to care because all it cares about is model listeners and as long as those three functions in the interface is there, it is going to work. So if I change some, something in the, in the view, the model wouldn't be affected at all. Keeps you from writing nice code. Uh, sometimes when you write code, you make a change, and you have to change in some other place, and in some other place. And when you do it like this, you kind of avoid that to a very high uh, extent. So this is a auto-generated, uh, auto-generated uh, image. I've been generating docsgen. You can see that the files in the logic accessing files in the controller view a model. Uh, we can see that the view is accessing only the model, and we can see that the model is not accessing anything else. Uh, if you look up. Model view, uh, model view controller architecture on Wikipedia, you can see that uh, that is basically how they explain this pattern, how it should work. So, when running Doxygen with an automated, uh, automated documentation system, you can actually verify that your code does work like it's supposed to. And you can see the, the uh, diagram here. Uh, there is one small error though, if, you're, if you have a sharp eye. You can see that the controller actually accessing the view is because the view creates a window and when you need to register the, the uh, keyboard and mouse input, it needs the window handle. Um, so at the moment I just hacked in a function uh, and made the controller call it to get the window ID. You could get rid of the dependency between the controller and view by actually letting the, the, the view put uh, uh, put something in, in, put the window handle in the model which could be fetched by the logic and given to the controller for something. Here's another example. I don't know if you see that very well, but down here we have the overview, and it inherits from the I view, 
which is the interface for the view. And, it turned, and here you can say, you, you can see that it, it does inherit from the um, I model listener that we was seen before. And this is also an auto-generated uh, Doxian image. Another kind of great idea with this, um, you can see um, how the system actually, with the weak references, that the system doesn't really know about each other. Um, for example, if you, I guess we'll in here, when the, when, the, when the view, which is an ogre implementation at the moment, actually get a pointer to the model, doesn't really get a pointer to the model, it gets a pointer to an interface to the model. Like here, Abidos I model. I stands for interface. So when you get a reference, you get a, a reference to the interface. Which means when different things communicate, they don't directly communicate. They do get interfaces, pointers to each other. And here you can see how it registers itself um, on this model. And behind this, I could, for example, have a model. I can have different models. I could have a model that has some physics in it, or I could have a model that doesn't have it. And I could have just changed the model around without actually having to change in this class. And there's only one place in the code where, where actually things know uh, about each other. It's in the client.cpp. Uh, in the beginning, when I actually create all the different systems, you can see how the main function here, it creates a new model, but it actually stores it as an interface model. I create a new ogre view, but I don't store it in an ogre view, I store it in an interface view. And later here, when I actually let things know about each other, I, 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 pass, the, uh, I pass the view. Here you can see, when I create, for example, the state manager or, or the sound system, they get the pointer to modern view, which are not really models or overviews, but interface model and interface view. So this is the only place in the system where I actually need to decide which implementations, for example, if I should use Ogre or DirectX or some, some other uh, game engine or rendering engine. Which makes it a quite simple system when you want to replace functionality. For example, we recently changed from ODE physics to bullet physics. And this means that when I did that, I didn't have to change anywhere else as long as I, I had the same interface. As long as the interface was the same, I didn't need to change anywhere else in the code to replace my ODE physics to the bullet physics. And I think that was all. Yeah? Any questions? How many years have you spent uh, developing the MMO server? Uh, I started to develop the MMO server in 2008. So actually 2006, I tried some versions first uh, in Python uh, for a year or something like that. So it was about 2007, I think. And I actually managed to get a server up and running. And it was working, you could, could log in, and there was a rabbit, and you were a ball, and it had physics. You could run around and hit the rabbit and everything. And you could be two players, it was awesome. But then I kind of... Uh, thought to myself, how is this supposed to scale? I had to, you know, do 
into process communication between the different servers and I just thought I, there is no chance for me that I could make this highly scalable myself within a reasonable amount of time. So that's why I did some research on better ways to do stuff and how I ended up using it on and see for the for the server. Yeah. What happens if the main supervisor crash? What do you say? The main supervisor for a server. Uh, what was the yeah, question? The supervisor. Yeah. The highest one. Yeah. The ones that keeps. What if that one crashes? Then everything crashes. Okay. It's. Uh, you, you generally have uh, supervisors um, that you, you can say to a supervisor if you crash like more than 100 times in a minute you should or if the if if the things that you're supervising crashes more than 100 times during 10 seconds you just crash you, 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 uh, for yourself and if the other supervisor higher up catches that, it could have the same pattern, like if I crash more than 10 times during 10 seconds, I will crash myself, and the crashes will escalate up in the system. And in my current system, it basically means that if enough things crash really fast, it could cause the whole system to crash. Um, that is why you generally create uh, applications which have their isolated supervisors. 